So with ionic compounds, the most common question is comparing or ranking things based upon the strength of their bonds. We refer to the strength of their bonds, or I guess compare it by looking at lattice energy, the energy associated with going from the gaseous ions to the solid, or really it's kind of the bond energy or how much energy would it take to get those ions back apart. So there's a couple things, and we see them here, that we're looking at. But sometimes you might just compare two, or we can make big comparisons over multiple um, compounds like we have here. All of this comes back to Coulomb's law or Coulombic attractions. And sometimes in the question prompt, it would say include Coulombic attractions in your explanation, which is a great tip that you're just talking about how big are the charges and how far apart are they. So as we look at this, different ionic charges are stronger than others. Aluminum and nitrogen are plus and minus three. Magnesium and sulfur are plus and minus two. And the potassium fluoride and cesium iodide are plus or minus one. So our positive and negative twos and threes will always be stronger than the others. If we change our size, how big the atoms are, which is explained by the location on the periodic table, closer to the bottom is a larger radius, closer to the top is smaller, the smaller the radius, the stronger the bond. That's why calcium fluoride as a one-to-one -one is stronger than cesium iodide as a one-to-one. -one. Both cesium and iodide are near the bottom. There is potential where we could have some fighting or some competing um, factors on this. So like sulfur is technically in row, not technically, it's in row three, while um, nitrogen's in row two or potassium's in row two and sulfur's in row three. For those things, um, often you would either have to be given the data or there'd have to be enough with that trend or enough information there. So for example, potassium is actually in row four. So that's bigger than either magnesium or aluminum. So the radius there is larger. Nitrogen and fluorine are in the same row. Sulfur is one row lower down in row three. So the fact that not only do I have a lower charge, but also a larger cation supports this. So often there's multiple factors when you're asked to compare that kind of add up to help us know that. The second thing, and this is often way beyond what you could be asked on an AP question, is really just understanding the process. It's very unlikely that you would be asked all five of these at once, but maybe one piece or another in terms of understanding that my elements of calcium and sulfur do not just automatically bond together because it's a metal and a non-metal. I have to get them into the ionic form before that attraction happens. So the process here goes through a series of steps. Solid calcium, has to be sublimed or turned into a gas. To do that, you put energy in. We're overcoming the intermolecular forces as it goes from a rigid solid to a free moving gas. That gaseous calcium still won't bond. Calcium bonds in ionic compounds when it's a calcium ion. To lose electrons requires energy. So losing one electron requires a certain amount of energy. That's the first ionization energy. Losing another electron requires even a little bit more energy. We're taking the attract that electron, which is attracted to our nucleus, away. Ionization energy always requires energy. Despite the fact we say that something may want to lose electrons, it is favorable in the end result, but the loss itself requires energy. Sulfur is also a solid, so we would need to change its state. We would need to sublime it to overcome those IMFs. And then this gains electrons. The electron affinity isn't always super clear, whether it's endo or exo, and it varies in different instances. But in general, we say things with a high effective nuclear charge or a high ZEF release energy as they gain electrons. So sulfur is able to gain one, two electrons, and it may release some energy in doing that, even if it's slightly endothermic or one of these two is endothermic. Overall, it's probably more favorable.
the big release of energy. So note there's a whole bunch of inputs of energy and occasionally even the electron affinity process is endothermic. The big release, the reason calcium wants to lose electrons and sulfur wants to gain them is not because they want to turn into ions, but because once they are ions, the attraction between them is incredibly strong. A big release of energy between those ions that's much more energy released than the energy that came in to get us to the ions. So anytime we're describing this, it is the bond itself, the strong attraction holding the ions close to one another that's actually making them much, much more stable.